All right, so that's uh, working and actually pretty good on attendance. I should probably start 15 minutes late more often. Everybody's here. That's cool. Um, actually, there's still 19 to go, but that's a that's a darn good turnout. <laughs> <laughs> Mute everybody. There. Okay, so good morning, and let me go ahead and get started. This, ironically, this is a, a fairly, oh, great, errors, errors, errors. Man, I hope I didn't lose that whole video from this morning. That would be... Tragical. Gigabyte, yeah, it looks like it's there. Okay, make some real estate. Um, all right, so our, our lesson today is going to be uh, an overview and some of the theoretical background of network simulation modeling and with that is never going away now you guys aren't one and you guys are two well it's all the same stuff <clears throat> Except it's not there yet. Yay! All right, so I shall begin. So this um, uh, this lesson is on. Pipeline network hydraulics, uh, both the underlying principles and uh, <coughs> the modeling aspects of them. I wonder what's going wrong with my Zoom thing. Well, that seems fine. Oh, it's doing that. I don't think I'm sharing my screen yet, am I? Where'd it all go? <clears throat> it's going to be one of those days, isn't it? Good morning. Welcome to CE 3372 Water Systems Design Lesson 8, Pipeline Networks and Network Modeling. And in this lesson, we're going to examine the hydraulic theory as well as certain requisite arithmetic that's done in network simulation. Lesson description is still blank. And there's quite a bit of uh, potential reading. The a solution technique that will be discussed um, near the end of uh, today is uh, this hybrid solution um, method by Hamem and Braymiller from the 1970s. This is the algorithm that's implemented in EPA net, parts of SWIM, parts of Kentucky pipes, um, and a few other, uh, mo actually most commercial pipeline programs that do uh, either extended period simulation or steady state. Um, an older technique, even though the publication date is more recent, 
is a newton raston approach and um, that in that approach uh, pipeline networks have to consider individual loops so the the Heyman and Braymiller is actually a easier to implement method from a programming standpoint because you don't have to transition a directed graph. Um, there's some hydraulic notes and there's some examples of how to do this using the R scripting language. We'll, we'll examine those. Um, and then Words and James has good background, as does Chin. And then the Water Distribution and Land Development Handbook also has a good description. So network simulation modeling and network hydraulics is, is kind of key to the um, asking the question, will my network provide the necessary pressures and demands? Uh, is, is it physically capable of doing that? And so now I will proceed with lesson notes. There are quite a few um, what I call scripts. Uh, so there's a bunch of Excel versions and a bunch of R versions of network simulation models. And these are all really exist to explain the algorithm itself. Um, they, they could be used for practical cases, but, but their interface is not terribly efficient. And an analyst would find it somewhat difficult to use these as regular tools. And then the data, uh, supplemental data, it has a few um, uh, PDF uh, examples that are meaningful. And we will now begin with the notes. Uh, so this is my first lesson where I had to switch software because my laptop computer didn't have PowerPoint on it and I was unwilling to pay Microsoft for a license to install PowerPoint when I already paid for perpetual license once. Um, so human beings and the Microsoft Corporation have different opinions on what the word perpetual means. To them, it means perpetual income. I can't say as I blame them from a business point of view, uh, but I'm not going to do it. So I found another um, tool. And I actually have no idea how it's going to look, so we'll find out in a second. Yeah, it kind of looks the same. Um, it's a little bit weird with these uh, uh, white horizontal bars across it, but it'll work. Okay, so we will continue. So this is this is all in a single file instead of part one, part two, part three, and that was a consequence of having to switch presentation software. So here's uh, what uh, we hope to discuss today. Network hydraulic principles, constructing the system of equations, um, and solving those, and then uh, I think there'll be sufficient time to do adding of the pumps. If not, we'll pick that up at the next meeting. So the network hydraulic principles, there are really only two that are significant. The first is that at a junction, uh, mass is conserved. And what that translates to in a pressurized pipeline network is that the sum of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows is equal to zero at a junction or a node. By convention, positive demand at a node is considered an outflow, and that, that flow actually leaves the network. Uh, negative demand, um, think of injecting water into a network, would be an inflow. And we will be able to write a single balance equation for each node in the network. The other uh, guiding principle is that head has a single value. Uh, it's usually expressed as pressure, and the consequence of head being a single value is that along any link, so any connection between two nodes, along whatever that path is, so it usually be a pipe, um, energy is conserved, or the Bernoulli's equation is in effect that says that the head at one node 
is equal to the head of the other node plus the head loss going from node 1 to node 2, or whatever the naming convention is. Um, so head at a node uh, has a single value. It's often expressed as pressure, and um, you can think of that as the pressure at the node is the height that water would rise into a piezometer that's attached to the node. And the node itself has some elevation. So the elevation of the node plus that pressure head is the total head of the node. And we will write the arithmetic to handle the total head in the system. And then we can um, compute the pressures after the fact. So the conservation of energy along a conduit um, simply uh, leads to an energy equation uh, for each, each uh, link. And so in this uh, diagram, we have flow is actually going from the left to right in this case. And that red line is incorrect. It didn't translate correctly. <clears throat> Um, the elevation head plus the pressure head at this node puts us up here. The elevation head plus the pressure head at this node puts us up here. And a line that should be connecting the two, so this red line should go from that point up to this point, uh, tells us the uh, flow path. And so we would have that the total head at the left node is equal to the total head at the right node plus the head loss going from the left node to the right node. And that would be reflected as an energy equation along this pipe or this link. So we're going to have one energy equation for every link in the network. We'll have a mass balance equation for every node in the network. And um, if we can solve those equations simultaneously, we can obtain a flow and a pressure value for every node and every pipe in the network. But leading up to that, let's first consider this branched system. Um, <clears throat> so in this uh, is a classic problem from your fluid mechanics class. We have three reservoirs, A, B, and C. And they're connected uh, to each other by pipes that all go through a common junction labeled D, as in as in dog here. And as drawn, reservoir A uh, has uh, water leaving it, um, velocity in AD. We have velocity BD, and then we have velocity D going to C. So as they're drawn here, reservoir C is receiving water, reservoir A and reservoir B are contributing. These arrows represent uh, algebraic um, plus or minus signs, they are a direction convention. So if we calculate a negative velocity, that simply means flow is going the opposite of what we drew it here. Uh, and what we would get of if this were a network that we wanted to analyze is we would find one node where we could write a single continuity equation. And we have three links, a, uh, AD, BD, and DC. In each link, we know we can get one energy equation. So we have a total of four equations, continuity plus three energy. And there's four unknowns, which are the velocities in each pipe and the head at this junction. So I've stated this as if I know what the head at reservoir B, A, and C are. And they're shown here as heights above a datum to the reservoir pool. So if we were to apply our analysis methodology, which would be to write each of the head loss equations and the continuity equation, um, it would look something like this. We could write the total head at reservoir A is equal to the elevation of node D, whatever it is, plus the pressure head at node D. So this is this, is this green box. That's the total head at node D. So the total head at node A equals the total head at node D, plus this is the darcy Weisbach equation for head loss going from reservoir A to junction D. And it depends on the length of the pipe 
connecting them, the diameter of the pipe connecting them, and the as of yet unknown velocity squared in the pipe over 2g. Similarly for um, pipe BD, we can write that the total head at reservoir B is equal to the total head at node D plus the head loss going from reservoir B to node D, which again is a darcy weisbach equation um, with the length of the pipe, the diameter, and the as of yet unknown velocity squared in the pipe. Our next energy equation looks a little different, but it's the same thing. We have the total head at node D is equal to the total head at node C plus the head loss going from node D to C. Also depends on the length of the connection, the diameter of the connection, and the as of yet unknown velocity in that uh, node uh, D. So the green boxes represent the unknown head value and the red boxes represent the unknown uh, velocities or flow rates. The continuity equation at the node itself gives us one more uh, equation, which is the, um, the uh, flow into node D plus the flow in from node B is equal to the flow that leaves uh, the node going on to reservoir C. And from that, we have these three unknown velocities. So if we count unknowns, we have velocity AD, velocity BD, velocity DC. They also appear in these equations. And then the total head at node D. But you'll notice something about the energy equations. Velocity is squared. So this is a simultaneous system of nonlinear equations. Um, so to summarize, we have four equations and four unknowns. It's nonlinear. It's nonlinear in velocities, and uh, it happens to be quadratic, so these are usually pretty well behaved and quite solvable. So some of the techniques that are listed here, uh, one's Newton Raphson, we'll explore that a little further. Another technique that, it, that, that, that will work is called quasi-linearization. They're more or less uh, different names for almost the same thing. Um, there's not very many values, so one could conceivably start guessing values, and after a few minutes of guessing, you might likely stumble on a solution. You have the advantage if you choose the guessing in that you know that the total head at D can't be bigger than the total head at any of the reservoirs, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. So that gives you a starting place um, but we actually want a systematic method because we're rarely presented with three pipes in one node. Um, more likely 3,000 pipes, 2,000 nodes, and we want to do that every hour for a 24-hour cycle. So guessing is not an option. Um, so a second topological structure is a loop system where we have one or more pipes um, connecting to a node. So in this diagram here, this is a simple, very simple loop system. We have a node here, the blue dot, and we have another node up here, also a blue dot. And going into this, uh, this blue dot is connected through this two-foot diameter pipe to this blue dot, and it's also connected through a one-foot diameter pipe to the blue dot. The one-foot pipe is 3,000 feet long, and the two-foot pipe is also 3,000 feet long. And we have 20 cubic feet per second uh, coming into the network, 20 cubic feet per second leaving. So at this node right here, that 20 cubic feet per second distributes, a little bit goes down pipe one, and another little bit goes down pipe two. And how it distributes is, um, obviously hydraulically important and again we'll have a balance equation for each node and a head loss equation for each pipe and if we do that we have the following properties um, at the nodes we have inflow equals outflow energy is unique at the links we have head loss around the pipe and we have this additional 
observation that head loss around any closed loop is zero. Because whatever the head here is, if we lose it getting to this point, we're going to regain it coming back that direction. And uh, we'll now look at some numerical examples of uh, numerical examples of these instances. Let's consider first this system shown in Figure 19. In this example, the friction factors assume constant, and that that simplifies the arithmetic, and it's not a a, a gross simplification. It it's not that much harder to have a friction factor that varies as you're computing the answer, but it complicates things for explaining it, at least for the first time out. So we have reservoir 1, 2, and 3. Reservoir 1 has a pool elevation of 70 meters. Reservoir 2 has a pool elevation of 80 meters. Reservoir 3 has a pool elevation of 100 meters. And they're connected by these three pipes uh, uh, coming to a common junction here. Um, the 70 meter one is, is the lowest pool elevation, so water is going to be coming into it. But um, whether we specify that or not up front is irrelevant as long as we assume some flow directions and stay consistent throughout the analysis. Our hydraulics question is what is the discharge in each pipe, in each pipe and what would the total head at the junction be? Notice in this example, the junction elevation is not specified. So we can't determine the pressure head here, but we can determine total head. And then once we know what that elevation is, we can find the pressure. So we would take those four equations um, that we saw before and simply populate them with the numbers off the problem statement. In this instance, we have for uh, reservoir number one, Yeah, uh, 70 meters, which is the total head of that reservoir, equals the total head at node D plus 0 0.015, that's the friction factor, in the 5,000 foot pipe, 0 0.6 feet diameter, that joins uh, reservoir A and node D. And you notice the V squared term is written somewhat differently. It's, it's the velocity multiplied by the absolute value of the velocity. And what, what the purpose of that is, is it's a computational artifact that's used to allow the velocity's algebraic sign, plus or minus, to convey direction. So this, this is written as if uh, water's leaving reservoir A and flowing to node D. So if we get a negative value here, that means that the opposite is true. Water came from node D into reservoir A. <clears throat> Similarly, for the 100 meter reservoir, we write the same kind of equation. And again, we'll let the algebraic sign of the computed velocity convey the direction information. And then, um, <clears throat> Lastly, we write the, uh, the 80 meter reservoir um, also in the same way. And actually, there's been a sign change here because the algebraic statement here has positive as flowing from node D to reservoir C. So we had to make that sign change. Or we could have written it with positives and made that a CD. So this, this minus sign and that minus sign are a consequence of assumed flow direction. And then lastly, we have continuity at that node D. Um, so that's clearly the pipe area coming into node D from reservoir A, the pipe area coming into node D from reservoir B, pipe area coming into node D from reservoir C. So there's our four equations and four unknowns. The unknowns being velocity AD, velocity BD, velocity DC, and the total head at node D. Um, so the next step would be 
we could compute all the constants and organize the four equations into a system of simultaneous equations, as shown here, as shown as equation set 39 in the presentation. And because the system's nonlinear, um, we would have to uh, employ some tricks. So one way is to uh, solve it in Excel using the solver. It's not an efficient way, but it'll work for this small of a problem. And so we construct this equation set into a conventional vector matrix structure. And here we have a matrix of coefficients. You'll notice that the matrix of coefficients retains the absolute values of velocities. So we have to supply an initial guess of velocity. And it has to be non-zero, otherwise that matrix goes singular. And once we have the initial guess of velocity, we can multiply it by an initial guess of total head at node D, and that populates that whole side of the equation. We subtract off the right-hand side, so these are the um, terms that have to be satisfied at the correct solution, and the difference between those two is some error. We can square that error and then sum it up and then use the solver to try to minimize the sum of squared errors by changing the values HD, VAD, VBD, and VDC. Bearing in mind that in each change, we have to recompute this matrix. And it, it's not as hard as it sounds. So here is a screen capture of doing that. And I'm going to scroll through this somewhat quickly because I don't, want, I don't recommend uh, you, you choose this approach. And when we get done, these are the uh, resulting um, head and flow rate, about 82 meters of head. And um, you have <clears throat> these various um, cubic meters per second of flow coming, in, coming through the, uh, the respective pipes. And so there is the uh, a solution. So an alternative way to approach that is I think this is the uh, <clears throat> correct spreadsheet. So we'll go look at the spreadsheet. And I need to uh, change something. Okay, so now I've set it for iterative calculations. So this is implementing a formal Newton's method. So here we have the various coefficient terms based on the initial guess. So we'll make an initial guess of flow of 1 and everything and an initial head of 100. So here's our initial guess of the three flows and the head of 100. And then here's the resulting uh, right-hand sides. And actually, I think that 60 should be a 70 to be consistent with the uh, original problem. So let me go ahead and make that change. Hopefully that doesn't break anything. And so we take the coefficient matrix, we multiply it by the three flow guesses and the initial head guess, we subtract off the required right-hand side, and that is our error term. We want to drive each of those elements to zero. So if you recall, in Newton's method, you would take um, the new guess would equal the old guess plus the value of the function at the old guess divided by the first derivative of the function at the old guess. 
In this case, we have multivariable, multivariable functions. And so the equivalent of a derivative is called the Jacobian, and that's computed here. And uh, the equivalent of division is multiplication by the inverse, which is accomplished here. And finally, our update is accomplished here. And so now we will <coughs> set it up to do the systematic calculations. So we do it once, and it ignores me. But I think I pressed the wrong button. Yeah, there we go. And uh, got to answer amazingly fast. And we have almost the same answers in this instance. So that's, that's one way to do it demonstrated in a spreadsheet. That's not suitable. And the other way to do it would be to go to the hopefully that's the right one. We'll look at it in a Python script. If it's gonna work. <coughs> Yay. OK, so here we see the same setup as in the presentation. There's the indicated arithmetic. And now we're going to use Newton's method. So it's going to need a linear equation solver and a vector matrix library. So this bit of script, you don't have to program. All this does is solve simultaneous systems of linear equations. So you had that in your MATLAB class. You probably picked it up in other classes, too. And all this uh, script is is a collection of functions that lets us write matrices, write vectors, multiply matrices, multiply vectors, add vectors, subtract vectors, and um, compute the uh, inner product of a vector, a dot b, if you will. And here is the actual solution to the three reservoir problem. So we're going to define our first equation right here. So this one handles the um, 
head loss between junction D and the 70 meter reservoir. Second one, head loss between junction D and the 100 meter reservoir. The third one, the head loss between junction D and the 80 meter reservoir. And the fourth equation is the balance at the node D. So that's all that's going on in those uh, scripts. And we want to convert it into a multi, into a vector valued function. So all this uh, function does is evaluate each of the equations in order. And then we need the Jacobian, uh, which is defined as the first derivative of the particular equation with respect to its first, second, third, or fourth variable. And so here's the Jacobian of that system um, done line by line. Uh, if we wanted to generalize this, we have to come up with a, a matrix way to generate that. But for this simple problem, the Jacobian is shown line by line. And now we'll go ahead and actually run uh, the computation. So the first thing we do is uh, some, some setup. Uh, we, we create a place to store the changes in our guesses. We create a place to store the value of our guess. Uh, we create a place to store the values of the function at a particular guess. And we create a place to store the Jacobian at a particular guess. Then we uh, supply some initial values. And when we run the example, we'll just do one everywhere. Then we build the initial guess, build the initial Jacobian, write the values back out to the screen, and then we set up our solver toler tolerances. So this is when we're going to stop. Remember, we're trying to drive the function value to 0. So we're going to declare that 1 times 10 to the minus 9th is close enough to 0 uh, for stopping. So rather than actually run it, I'll just use the existing output. So when, when this was run in the past, the initial values for everything were guessed as 1. So it returns the initial guesses. So the first one is, is the flow in the first pipe flow and the second pipe flow and the th third pipe and um, <clears throat> total head. And then it produces the initial function vector. That's nowhere close to 0. And the initial Jacobian for each of those equations. Then we apply the algorithm a few times. Um, and it's set up to go as many as 25. And it ran. Not sure this uh, the iteration counts correct. But when it got done, it gave us that the head at the junction is 81. And the flow in the three pipes is minus 1.3, 2.5, and 0 0.7. And then we go ahead and, and tidy uh, things up and, and print the results back to us. So that's the second way to solve this problem. This is doing the same thing that that Excel spreadsheet did. And if you're familiar with uh, scripting, it's probably a little more understandable. Oh, cool. It remembered where it was. <clears throat> we can repeat it for a looped system, and uh, the same kind of analysis uh, can be accomplished. And again, in the loop system, we have, we have uh, two pipe equations, and the one uh, head equation. In the, in the olden times, if we're using the newton raphson MOOC method, we actually would have to introduce a fictitious flow term, and at the correct answer, it has a value of zero, and then you would you would uh, back compute the pressures. One of the um, things I want to bring your attention to is uh, 
we can come up with a loop equation that uh, handles the losses around the loop and it has to equal zero and use that to find the flow balance only. Um, here is the Newton-Raphson's method for a single uh, valued function and then shows the uh, extension uh, <coughs> to multi-value function. And then we did the example of the loop system, and here is the uh, spreadsheet for that. It goes through the same kind of things, and when it's done, um, you have uh, these information. So solving it in loops is not particularly efficient, because generally what we want as design engineers is we not, not only want to know what the flows are, we want to know what the pressures are at each node. So the technique we're going to use, we want a technique that can return flows and pressures. So if we combine branches and loops, and not the little ones, into a bunch of uh, into a big problem, what we have is called a network. There's multiple paths for water to flow in the system. The concept of demand are applied at the nodes or the junctions of the network. External supply, if we're going to force it in the network, is treated as negative demand. Alternatively, we can actually have a storage node. They're called fixed-grade nodes in the business, and attach that to the network and let the network compute what the uh, supply requirements are for that node. So some of the analysis techniques that have been used over the years. Um, there's a Hardy-Cross method that's in some of those readings that I have linked in the in the lesson website. Um, that's a somewhat older method now, and it's based on loop only approach. So what the Hardy cross method will do is give you flows, and then you have to later on back compute the uh, heads in the system. Although it's interesting that the uh, Hardy cross method actually evolved in structural engineering and was borrowed by water engineers for solving networks because the difference between a pipe network with flow and a structural network with um, stress flow is, is just semantics. Um, next uh, method that evolved was a newton raphson uh, approach and what that involved was loop equations and then we added in node balance equation. And the newton raphson approach can produce both pressures and flow rates for us. And then in the early 1970s, a couple of petroleum engineers, no, I got that wrong, electrical engineers, um, came up with this hybrid method where by combining node and pipe equations, uh, you can get the same result as if you could with the newton raphson loop and node equation, but you don't have to traverse loops. And that has uh, some very important implications in computer programs because not having traverse loops um, saves a lot of computational effort. The trade-off of uh, course is uh, that the matrices in the Heyman and Braymiller method are somewhat large as compared to either the Hardy Cross or Newton Raphson. So you're you're trading a <clears throat> programming simplicity for storage. In the 1970s and the early 80s when these were emerging, that was a big deal. Storage, uh, computer storage was problematic. Um, nowadays, I would argue that uh, certainly that's less of an issue than it used to be. And we'd be more than willing to uh, store zeros if it makes building and solving the system simpler from a programmatic sense. And then what the method does is simultaneously solve the nonlinear system for flow and heads pretty much by the um, newton raphson method just described uh, above. And <clears throat> the largest network I know of uh, from a colleague uh, that he solved, he does this for a living, uh, is um, going to try to pull the numbers from memory, but I believe it was 280,000 nodes 
and uh, at least 200,000 pipes, a bunch of pumps and a bunch of storage things. So the hybrid method um, really made a scale of that size possible. Um, noon raffson method could conceivably do that, but it would spend much of its computation time finding the individual loops and um, handling the uh, solutions along the edges. Uh, a, a network of that size doesn't doesn't solve very quickly. So I mean, to simulate an hour of real time might take five or six minutes of computer time. Nevertheless, uh, it it it's a useful tool, and when combined with um, actuators, can be used for automated control. And that's pretty much how automated control pipeline systems work. Is that it's running a hydraulic model in the background all the time. It's checking its sensors, and if the sensor detects a change, it can send the change to the hydraulic model right away, and the computer control algorithm can figure out what the change should produce and possibly move an actuator uh, to achieve a desirable network state. So we're going to look at the uh, Heyman and Braymiller uh, method. Um, using this as an example network. We'll go through the gory details of, of programming that in. We'll uh, do it in either Python or R. And I want to go back and actually show you the original paper. So this, this was an original paper, Hybrid Method for Solving Pipe Networks. And you'll notice a very, uh, very similar to my arithmetic, which would make sense because I pretty much read the paper and translated it. Here they're using coefficients to handle the plus and minus flows. And here they have the issue of loop counting. And what this first part is going is, is, is mathematically demonstrating why the loop approach is problematic because we have to keep track of the loops. And then what they observe is they can eliminate that entirely um, by treating it as a network of resistors and inductors. And they have a few examples. They discuss the initial um, estimates and then go through some, some results. So this was a landmark um, paper that many of the water engineers don't really know about because these guys were electrical engineers and what would they know? Um, yet their contribution is huge. <clears throat> Okay, so let's consider this system, um, and we'll go through the Heyman and Braymiller method, or at least the setup, uh, slowly. So we have a reservoir here, and we're going to stipulate that the pool elevation in the reservoir is 100 feet. It's connected by a single pipe to node N1 in the system. Node N1 has two pipes leaving it. One goes to node N2, the other one goes to node N3. They're labeled pipe 2 and pipe 4 respectively. If we go to node N2, that has pipe 2 coming into it, pipe 6 coming into it, and pipe 3 leaving it. It also has a 4 cubic feet per second demand leaving the node. And then pipe 3 connects node 2 and node 4. And node 4 has pipe 3 coming in, pipe 5 coming in one cubic foot per second demand leaving the node. And lastly, node three has pipe four entering, pipe five leaving, pipe six leaving, and it has its own uh, demand of three cubic feet per second. So that's a typical network. The red arrows shown here are um, <clears throat> declared positive flow rates. So if our algorithm produces a negative number for one of those red arrows, that means that the actual flow rate is in the opposite direction. The kind of 
dark blue arrows represent the demands at each of the nodes, and the nodes themselves are labeled as are the pipes. Um, the only other piece of information that's actually missing from this drawing is we would want we would want to know the node elevations so that we can compute pressures. As it stands right now in this picture, all we can obtain is the total heads of the nodes. <clears throat> For each of the pipes, there's a table there that has the pipe name, pipe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, the length of the pipe in feet, the diameter of the pipe in feet, and lastly we're told that the sand roughness height for all pipes is 1 times 10 to the minus 5th, I assume feet, and the viscosity of water is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 5th feet squared per second. Those two pieces of information are required to calculate a Reynolds number and a friction factor for each pipe at each step of the solution. Now the the amount of water that's going to flow through pipe one is trivial to figure out. It's going to be four and three is seven and one is eight, because that's the only way supply comes in. But we'll pretend we don't know what pipe one is uh, as we build the algorithm, because we want to come up with something that's general for any network. So in that drawing, there's six pipes, four nodes plus one reservoir. The reservoir is called a fixed grade node. So we're going to we're going to stipulate what the uh, total head is going to be at that node. And then we uh, have the demands at the node, flow arrows for the sign convention. We write continuity for each of the nodes, and we write energy loss for each of the links, and then we assemble the equation set and solve it simultaneously. So in both assembling the equation and solving it, um, this is the structure that, that I'm going to use. Our unknown vector of, of um, unknowns contains the values for the six pipe flows. And these values can take on positive or negative algebraic sign, and depending on which the direction is. And then it's going to contain the values of heads at the four nodes, the unknown heads. And we're going to call that vector x. So first we'll build the node and pipe equations. If we look at um, node number 2 for instance, uh, we have uh, q2 coming in, q3 leaving, q6 coming in, and the demand at node 2 is 4. So that, that defines a nodal balance equation. We can do that for each of the uh, nodes in the system. We have an equation for each one. Uh, similarly, if we define head loss in any pipe, is the change in head along the pipe is F, L over D, uh, 8 over pi squared G times the absolute value of flow in the pipe times the flow in the pipe. And we can replace this group, this F, 8, L, pi squared G, D to the fifth, absolute of Q, with the symbol capital L. So think of that as a, as a loss coefficient. If the change ahead in that pipe is equal to the loss coefficient multiplied by the current flow in the pipe. This loss coefficient also contains the current flow. That's what introduces the nonlinearity into the system of equation. So we'll have six equations for each pipe. For example, pipe 2, the equation is minus L2 Q2 plus H1 minus H2 equals 0. And that's the head equation rearranged in a particular way so that when we assemble the system of equations, things are in the correct location. If we do that to build the node and the pipe equations, for each node, all we have are flows, and they're either plus 1, minus 1, or 0, indicating plus 1 indicates that the pipe is connected to that node and the flow is into the node. Minus 1 indicates the pipe is connected to that node and the flow is leaving the node. 0 indicates the pipe is not connected to the node, and this block of zeros over here indicates that the, the head term doesn't enter the node equations. So this first row is for node 1, node 2, node 3, and node 4 in that particular model. Uh, the next uh, set of equations are the individual head loss equation. So for example, at, in pipe 1, 
we have um, the <clears throat> the loss coefficient in pipe one, and we have H1, so that's the head at node one, and everything else is zero. And the head at node zero, which is the reservoir in this case, will appear on the right-hand side. We're going to name this matrix A of X, where X denotes the value of the unknown vectors, and it's used to compute each of these values of L that goes into the matrix. Now, if we want to look at the right-hand side of that system of equations, um, we would have the right-hand side, the first part of it would, would comprise the demands in each of the nodes. So node 1 has 0 demand, node 2 has 4, node 3 has 3, and node 1, node 4 has 1. And then we would have the um, heads uh, along each of the pipes. So with the exception of the first one, which connects to the fixed grade node in this particular configuration, all those heads are supposed to equal zero because we've written them as a head loss equation. Head at beginning minus head loss equals head at end. That's, that's what we've written the equation in. And then we've rearranged it to head at the beginning minus the head loss minus head at end equals zero. So with the exception of the first one, which contains the fixed grade node, these are all zero. And so now our system looks like the following. A of x times x equals b. And if we expanded it out using our linear algebra knowledge, uh, it would look something like that. We, we, we recall that the system's nonlinear. I keep reiterating that, but it's important. Uh, it's nonlinear in Q. And um, if we had the correct values of Qs and the correct values of capital H's in here, if we took that coefficient matrix, multiplied by that guess vector, and the guess vector was correct, we would obtain the right-hand side shown here. 0, 4, 3, 1, minus 100 zeros remaining. This horizontal line there is a visual um, note to myself. Everything above the horizontal line represents the node equations. Everything below the horizontal line represents the pipe equations. This partition here, this corner uh, of all zeros, is um, the portion of the matrix that tells us that the node equations don't involve the head values. This portion of the matrix right here of minus ones and zeros conveniently turns out to be the transpose of the part of the node matrix that corresponds to the flows. So the only input that's needed to construct this matrix is this upper partition. The node arg instance matrix is all that's required. And of course we have to specify a particular head loss model. In the case of Darcy Weisbach, um, uh, we get what I've been using here. But all we need is that matrix to uh, um, build the uh, model. So that matrix could be thousands of lines long and thousands of columns long. It doesn't matter. As long as we have computer memory, we're good to go. The hybrid method, um, oh, we're actually uh, moving along. And so now we want to go look at the, want to go look at the actual method. The thing I want to look at it in the R, <coughs> <coughs> scripting version video Moodle data so that that looks to me like that is the uh, no that's not the same problem That's definitely not the same problem. Let's go back to problem one because I can switch it to pretty sure that should be a 100. So 
except I can't edit in a website. So I've downloaded the two things, and let me point out some reading. Let's see, Pipes Network Lounge, page 123. See if I can find. I'm pretty sure this is the same problem, but I want to uh, use the same one because. Okay, cool. This is the same problem, and the input file. <coughs> That's the input file. They're not making this easy on me today. I figure out what that <coughs> point fifty eight is doing there. Zero point five and then eight hundred. There we go. Okay, so there's our um, input structure and uh, we will save it <clears throat> and it's not going to open because it's a computer There we go. So our studio, you should be familiar with from other classes. It's a uh, computing environment. It's it's free. You download it, and it runs on pretty much um, Macintosh, Windows, or Linux, all pretty much the same. So here's the uh, script we're going to run, and.
we get the file name is pipe network.txt. So let's look at the uh, script. We have a function for computing friction factors, and that function needs a roughness, a diameter, and a Reynolds number, and it will do that for each pipe that we tell it to. We have a function that computes We have a function that computes velocity in circular pipes as a function of diameter and supply discharge. We create a function that computes a Reynolds number and a, uh, a function that handles the geometry. So the geometric factor um, is kind of like all the geometric parts of the loss uh, model except um, the, the viscosity term. Next we have to uh, read data from the, from the input file and so our input file <coughs> our input file is pipe network. The first thing we read is how many nodes and that's, there's four nodes. How many pipes? There's six pipes. Next thing it reads is the pipe diameter going from pipe one, two, three, four, five. And put that sixth one in the right place. Um, next it reads how long each pipe is. So the 800, 800, 700, 700, 800, 600. Next, it reads the roughness coefficient for each pipe. In this case, it's all the same number, but it's repeated uh, six times for the pipe count. Next, we have the viscosity of the fluid that's in the network. In this case, we're using water viscosity. Next, it reads the initial guess. And since we are trying to come up with a systemic tool, we just guess ones everywhere. We can't guess zero. It'll fail if we guess zeros. And then the next part is the node arc incidence matrix. So for example, node one has pipe one coming in, pipe two leaving, and pipe four leaving. Node two has pipe two coming in, pipe three leaving, pipe six coming in. Node three has pipe four coming in, pipe five leaving, pipe six leaving, and so on. The last thing we read is the right-hand side. So demand at node 1 is 0, demand at node 2 is 4, demand at node 3 is 1, demand at node 4 is 1. And the head at, at the fixed grade node, or at node 0 if you will, is, is minus 100. And so when it's moved back to its correct position in the Bernoulli equation, it will have a value of 100. And then the head and everything else is zero. Then after it's read that, um, we do a little bit of uh, work to convert those string values, because those are just characters right now, into numeric values. Then we report back to ourselves what we just read. Uh, then we start building the matrix. The, aug the augmented matrix is the matrix that has that horizontal line in it. And um, so the upper left partition, the matrix, is just the node arc incidence matrix. It's what got read in. The um, lower right partition is uh, <coughs> minus 1 times the transpose of the node arc matrix. Um, and then the remaining part gets built on the fly. Um, so we're going to need some working vectors. Uh, so we keep track of pipe velocity, Reynolds number, friction factor, geometry, loss factor, the Jacobian matrix, and uh, G of Q is, at this point, it's just a storage value. Um, we get the current guess, the update guess, and the uh, uh, solved guess. 
And now we compute the geometry factors. We only need to do this once. And then comes the iterative step, the repeated calculating. So how many is going to be how many times we're going to allow this to go on. First, we compute the current velocity, the current Reynolds number. Once we have those two, we can compute current friction factors. Then we compute the current loss factor. That's the capital L in the um, matrix. Then we build the function matrix by operating on the lower left partition. And in the lower left partition, here's where we put the, the cap Ls. And all this is is a, a double nested loop that's stepping through the correct rows and columns to put the loss factor in the correct place. Um, and now we'll copy the current function matrix in the Jacobian and make uh, the changes in that the Jacobian matrix below the horizontal line is simply the current function matrix multiplied by 2. Then we build the augmented matrix and we solve the linear system for the change in flows. We update the change in flows and test for stopping. So we stop when the update doesn't change. We stop when the function gets close to zero, which is our desired result. Um, or we stop when the iteration count gets too big. And then finally, we just write the results back to ourselves. So I'm going to go ahead and run this and hope it actually works. Pretty interesting, no output. Hmm. Oh, my bad. I clicked the wrong button. There we go. And so now it is done all those calculations for the network, and here's what it reports back to us. There were four nodes, six pipes. Uh, the pipe lengths are not being uh, imaged back because they're suppressed. And it gives the flow rate in pipe 1 is 8, which we knew ahead of time. Flow rate in pipe 2 is 4. Flow rate in pipe 3 is pretty small, 0.26. Flow rate in 4 is 4. Flow rate in 5, 0.73. Flow rate in 6 is 0.36. The head at node 1 is 84. The head at node 2 is 55. Node 3 is 56. Node 4 is 55. We can get the friction factors back. And if we knew the elevations of the node, those four lines give us the pressures in the system. Um, so let me close that. Don't save it. So I showed you an R script to do it, and if we want to add a pump to the system, uh, we treat it as a different kind of link. We'll pick that up again next time, because we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, and we'll go through that again slowly, and then that will prepare us for going into the uh, uh, EPA net, the professional model. What you'll see in the uh, professional model is that the interface is a lot easier for building a network. Okay, Raju, are you still there? Yes, okay, so I have a the, well. the way you could um, get some guidance on that is you get the right place. So this is out of the San Marcos manual. So this uh, gives some guidance in Fireflow. Uh, also out of the San Marcos manual, this gives uh, spacing. And I don't think that's a terribly useful uh, table, actually. 
Also out of the San Marcos manual, um, it tells you how long a fire is going to be, two hours. <clears throat> and then from the water distribution system, there's an estimating fire flow description. It explains uh, what's referred to in the San Marcos manual because they reference the um, ISO studies. Um, right here, Insurance Standards Office, and this part of that ch chapter uh, gives some guidance on the Insurance um, Standards Office. Uh, so that that is <coughs> the guidance for uh, taking maximum daily demand plus fire flow. Uh, so your maximum daily demand, I mean, it might, might be on the order of Three thousand or four thousand gallons a minute for that particular network. Um, that may be actually high. Maybe it's six hundred gallons a minute. Just saying. And then you add the fire flow, and you have to make a uh, logical decision that um, you're not going to involve more than two hydrants. It's physically impossible because of the distances that are prescribed. So you would take that six hundred gallons a minute and add either a thousand gallons a minute to that for a single hydrant or as it's written here two thousand gallons a minute for two hydrants and that would be uh, your worst case fire plus maximum daily demand alternatively because you know how many um, houses there are or how many lots there are you could use this formula because you know the floor area and um, you'd have to look up uh, construction or just use ordinary construction. You could estimate what the floor area is. You get the fire flow rate for a single a single house and um, you could multiply that by the number that are likely to be on fire at any time. That was what I intended for you all to uh, consider for that part of the exercise. I'm sad to say there's no magic software that you put in the picture and it gives you numbers. Well, there probably is, but there's no telling what they're going to be. Um, does that uh, help, Raju? Yeah, it does. Thank okay. you. Alan, would that be for each node or a collection of nodes? So the the collection of nodes is how you get maximum daily demand for that entire network. Because whether it's burning down or not, it, it's going to be the collection. But the fire flow is only likely to be applied at a single hydrant or two at the most. Those nodes are probably five or 600 feet apart in the drawing. So at most, uh, it's going to be for two nodes. Um, but total system demand will still require those two fire flows. Later on when we build the simulator model, we're going to want to figure out which two nodes uh, matter the most. And you would, you would do that by activating the fire flow um, sequentially at, at node pairs uh, based on, on topography is it is it worse if it's the nodes that are at the 70 foot elevation or is it worse if it's the nodes at the 50 foot elevation and that that's the level of um, detail you need to go to you only have to try a few node pairs and then that would give you guidance on what the worst case pressure in the system is going to be but that's actually coming up for a future uh, thing so the, the fire flow is not logically distributed across every node. If you did that, you'd have like 16 foot pipes in that network, and that's ridiculous. It's, a, it's, a, it's a cross node pairs. So when you're building the table with the fire flow, you would make a notation that, that, that would perhaps do it for two um, adjacent nodes, and you put a notation saying fire flow is assumed to be in node pairs only based on the fire hydrant spacing and it's unlikely that there would be enough 
fire hose available in a fire to bring three hydrants to a local fire spot. So that's my uh, best answer for you, Alan. Hopefully that helps. Anyone else? I have a question. Yep, go. Can we submit, or are you asking us to submit a spreadsheet, or do you want just a table and like a Word document on Blackboard when we submit it? It doesn't really matter to me. Um, bear in mind you're going to need that table later as you're building your simulation model. So you want to put it in something that's easy to get those numbers in and out of. So either spreadsheet or Word document should satisfy that condition. Okay, thank you. All right. Anybody else? Okay, excellent. Um, I will terminate the call in a second and wish you all a great afternoon and have a really good weekend. Um, stay safe, you know, the usual admonition, stay safe, don't breathe on people, don't get breathed on. And um, uh, we will see you next week. And what we'll do next week is we'll pick up some pieces of the network simulation modeling because I kind of went through it pretty quickly. And then we will work our way towards the EPA Net Simulator program. So everybody have a great day and goodbye.